Whether you're building a dominant hammer saw, your first lifter, or just adding a self rider understanding how servos work and how to choose one can mean the difference between winning and losing a fight. I use servos on a daily basis, whether designing fixtures to cycle test products or on my moderately successful flipper, Bigfoot. So I feel confident coming in to tell you everything that you need to know about servos. Let's start out by talking about how servos work. Servos periodically receive signals of variable widths that determine what position it should be at. This makes servos good for any time you want position controlled movement as opposed to speed controlled movement. If you were to crack open a servo, you'd find these components, a potentiometer that tells the servo where it currently is, the control circuit that interprets the potentiometer signal and the signal from the controller and tells the motor what to do. And the motor moves to the position it's told to with the drive gears that gear it down in order to have the right amount of torque going to the output spline that connects to whatever you're mechanically trying to move. Now that we understand how servos work, the rest of this video is gonna be structured around the different characteristics of a servo that you need to care about so that you can better choose a servo and better design your robot around it. The first characteristic I'll talk about is the size, such as micro, mini, and standard. These sizes exist so that you can buy different servos from different manufacturers and know that they'll fit. While the sizes are consistent in two dimensions, while you're looking at them top down, I've seen variants in their size lengthwise, whether that be that they stick out more on the bottom or I've also seen it where the spline is at a slightly different height, which has caused problems in the problems in the past so keep that in mind if you're switching between different servos of the same size. There's also this fillet feature that I've seen change that can matter depending on how you have your servo mounted. Note that since micro servos and standard servos appear to be the most common they have the most accessories for them so if you're designing it around stuff like that then you should keep that in mind. The next thing I'll talk about is the servo spline. This is going to be the interaction point from your servo to your servo horn or whatever other attachment you have. While these are typically the same among servos of the same size, sometimes that's not always the case. So we have to keep in mind uh, what the servo spline is, what the servo you're using. And on the other side, you have to keep in mind what servo spline the attachment or servo horn that you have uses. Uh, servo City is actually a really good source for servos horns and servo attachments they make it super clear which uh, servo spline it's supposed to go to while also they have a lot of other options like they have one that's meant to attach to a pulley and they have another they have a gear that can go directly onto a regular servo so that's nice by the way servo city isn't a sponsor i just like that they have all the specifications on their servos uh, step files for their products plenty of stuff to attach to servos. They also have a bunch of guides on their website uh, going into the weeds more than this video does. So you should probably check them out if you're planning on putting a servo in your robot. Let's talk about the voltage range real quick. While there are exceptions that you should probably look into, uh, most servos are meant to operate on a 2S battery. So think six volts to 8.4 volts. While I wouldn't worry too much about running a 7.4 volt servo on an eight, the full 8.4 volts of a 2S, I wouldn't try to run it on a 3S because you're probably going to burn it out eventually, even if it even if it lasts a few fights. Also, if you are running a 3S battery in your robot and you're running uh, a more common servo, you're going to want to use an adjustable BEC. Uh, this will get you as close as you can to the 8.4 volts. Since most BECs are five volts, I only know of using an adjustable BEC in order to get the proper voltage. Next, we're gonna talk about speed and torque. Both of these are directly proportional to voltage. The no load speed is gonna be, is measured in the time it takes for the servo to travel 60 degrees with no load on the servo. While the stall torque is measured in ounce inches. So think that many ounces an inch away from the center of pinion. And at that torque, the servo is going to be moving, isn't going to be moving at all. Way of looking at the relationship between these two is think of the no load speed. You're at the max speed and you're at zero torque. 
while on the other end you have the max torque and you have zero speed. So in the middle, if, you are, if the load on the servo is half of the stall torque, you're going to have half the speed. So you can expect that a ser if you have two servos that have the same no load speed and one has a higher stall torque, if they're trying to lift the same weight, the one with the higher stall torque is gonna be moving faster. I should add that a lot of servo manufacturers just straight up lie about the torque output on their servos. I'm thinking specifically a lot of those cheap servos you see on Amazon, like that $14 servo is not putting out 20 kilogram centimeters of torque. I'm sorry, it's just not the case. Like they're just lying about that. So keep that in mind. Uh, there's actually a guy here on YouTube called, his channel's called RC Review. He actually does a good job of testing servos and making sure they perform as well as they advertise. So if you want another a channel to look at specifically for like servo stuff, he also does a lot of other RC stuff, but you should check out his channel. Next, we're gonna talk about the no load current and the stall current. This is gonna matter mostly because you're gonna to wanna to make sure the BEC you're using or the battery you're using can put out that stall current when you need it. As far as like for calculating it into your battery life considerations, I would figure out how you're using your servo and sort of use a ratio between the no load current and stall current. The last big thing I'm gonna talk about is the max rotation or throw, which is the range of motion for your servo. This is kind of important because if you're expecting your servo to go 180 degrees and only goes 120, you're gonna have a huge headache. While the most straightforward solution might be to just buy a servo with the max rotation you want, that servo might not have the speed and torque you want. So assuming your servo doesn't have a physical limitation on its throw, its max rotation can be increased in one of three ways. The first way involves taking apart the servo and cutting two wires going from the potentiometer to the control board and adding in two resistors. This might not be ideal if you're not comfortable taking apart the servo and soldering in resistors because you could end up doing more harm than good. The second solution is to buy a reprogramming tool and to reprogram it to have a higher max rotation. The problem with this is it only is applicable to certain brands and certain models of servo, so there's a good chance this won't be applicable in your situation. The third option is based on the receiver and controller you have. Some receivers and controllers have a servo extender that can increase the max rotation of the servo. And with that said, if your max rotation is higher than you want it, most controllers do have an option to decrease the range of signal that can be sent to it. So that's a way that you can lower the max rotation. Just a couple more things before I close out the video. Uh, make sure you know the material of the gears. While steel is obviously gonna be your best bet for durability, um, there might be instances in smaller robots where you might be able to get away with plastic and save some weight. But that should be a conscious decision when you, you make when designing it and not something you find out when you pick up your servo. The last thing you should know is the direction of rotation for your servo. Uh, this is gonna end up dictating what side of the robot your servo is gonna be on. While this is usually clockwise, if you end up messing it up, it's usually pretty easy to reverse on the controller, especially if you picked up the one that I recommended in my Antweight Electronics video, which should be on screen now. You should watch that if you want a wiring diagram for your robot, um, product recommendations for Antweight robots, especially starting out, and just general things that you should know about each component for picking one out.